Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And um, so we're going to carry on our discussion about DNA and its use in forensic science. I am spending some time uh, discussing the structure of DNA and a little bit about its function, because I think it's really important that you have that understanding. It makes understanding how it's used very much easier, but also this is a basic piece of knowledge, which I think everybody ought to have or to leave college with. Um, and uh, before we go any further, please make sure that you have watched this movie, uh, which I put up at our last class, the, dis the discovery of the double helix structure by these workers, Rosalind Franklin, Harold Wilkins, James Watson, and Francis Crick. Um, that gives you a really good basic understanding about the structure of DNA, but we're going to talk a little bit more um, about some of the details, and then also a little bit about its function as well. Um, so let's have a look. First of all, <clears throat> the nucleic acids, whichever nucleic acid we're talking about, they are a polymer. They are made up of monomers. They're made up of the monomers joined together to form the polymer. And in nucleic acids, there are only four monomers. Whichever nucleic acid we're talking about, they are made up of four monomers. The two nucleic acids that we are going to, you're going to hear about, mainly DNA, okay, because that's going to be the focus of our interest in forensic science. But I will also mention the other really important nucleic acid, which is RNA. And uh, RNA you have probably heard about in relationship to uh, the COVID crisis, because some very important vaccines are mRNA, messenger RNA vaccines. By the time we finish talking about nucleic acids in this class, you will understand a little bit about how what M messenger RNA is and what its function is. So remember that the nucleic acids are made up of four nucleotides. The nucleotides are the, mon are the monomers which are joined together to form the polymeric nucleic acid. DNA is an incredibly long molecule. It's very, very long, it's very, very strong, and it's very, very durable, but it's also very variable. It can, it, uh, if we look at the sequence of the, the monomers, they can come in any combination, potentially any combination. The combination they come in is very important because it specifies something particular. So let's have a look first of all at what these monomers are, then we'll think about how they get joined together. So this is the base, don't freak out, okay? I'm not going to expect you to remember all of the chemistry. I want you just to have an idea about the basics, the basic structure and everything of, of these things. So this is, a, this is a nucleotide, that is the monomer. This is the basic structure of the monomer. And it consists of a sugar here. And then it has a phosphate group here. There's the reason I want you to remember the phosphate group you'll see in a second. Okay, so it has a phosphate group there, and it has a sugar there. And then it has here, a, what we refer to as a nitrogenous base. It's a complex ring structure, which is made with uh, many, many nitrogen molecules in it. And it's basically a little, although the whole DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, although the whole molecule is very weakly acid, this part here is actually alkali. It's a base. And in any of the nucleotides, there are four possible bases that could be joined here. So in other words, what we have, we have this basic structure, phosphate group attached to a sugar here, and then attached, also attached to the sugar. There is, in this case, one of four possible bases in DNA. Those four bases you need to remember are cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. 
cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine can possibly be attached here. So we would have four different monomers. And those monomers can be joined together. And they're joined together by these phosphate groups, which bond to the sugar of the next monomer. So have a look here and you'll see. Here is the sugar group there. Okay, there's its base there. That's that there. Here is a phosphate group. And this phosphate group is joining it to the next sugar there. There's another base, could be any of the four bases. Phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, et cetera, et cetera. What is really, what we need to remember in forensic science is that two things. First of all, this backbone here is very, very strong. It's extremely strong. It's made up of what we call covalent chemical bonds, which are the strongest of all of the bonds. So they're very, very powerful bonds. They're difficult to break. So the second thing of it, significance is that I can, just because I've got this base here, doesn't mean to say I have to have that base there. I could have any of the four bases there. Just because I've got this base here doesn't predict what I'm going to have there. I could have any of the four bases. So I can put these bases, G, guanine, A, adenine, T, thymine, or C, cytosine. They can be joined together in any order for very, very, to form very, very, very long polymers, very long molecules. And what is the, the sequence that they come in here, it depends where in the DNA they are, but there are big stretches of the DNA where the sequence of these bases actually determines what the DNA is coding for what we need to remember. An area of the DNA, which is codes for a protein, is called a gene. That is what a gene is. A gene is an area of the DNA with a specific sequence, which is coding for a specific protein. That is the gene. The DNA, as we look through the whole length of the DNA, we have meters of DNA in a in our cells. As we look through the DNA, however, we'll find that there are many areas which are dedicated genes, but there are many interspersed areas which are not coding for protein. They have various functions, but they don't code for protein. So that's how our DNA is made up. Our, chromos our DNA is made up of sections which code for protein, but there are also long intervening sections which do not code for protein. They have various functions which we won't go into. So each strand is made up of nucleotides, monomers, joined together by very strong phosphate sugar bonds there. And then attached to them, there are these bases which are the identifying bases for that, for this nucleotide. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine in DNA. Well, in DNA, that's only half the story because this strand here is just one of the two strands that make up DNA. And in in parallel to, in DNA, in parallel to that, there is another strand. Actually, it is said to be anti-parallel. It is upside down compared to the strand here. Upside down because have a look here, you'll see here, it says five prime end. Never mind about why, just except from me for the moment, this is the five prime end. If I look at the other strand of DNA here, it's the three prime end will be here and the five prime end here. So three prime always matches to five prime. Five prime matches to three prime. Just remember that as a rule, never mind about. There are good reasons why that is, 
we won't go into it. Okay, so first of all, we've got a long, strong strand here. It has a certain sequence of bases here. What does this strand on the other side look like? Well, there's a rule. And the rule states that if this is an A, it must match to a T on the other strand. So if I have adenine here, I must have a thymine base there. If I have guanine here, it must match to a cytosine there. If I have a cytosine here, it must match to a guanine on the other side. The, have a look here and you'll realize these two, adenine and guanine, have two rings. One, two, one, two. Cytosine and thymine only have one ring. One, one, okay? So if cytosine always matches to guanine and guanine always matches to cytosine, and adenine always matches to thymine and thymine to adenine, it means that across this bridge here, we always have three, three rings. We have a constant distance across here, always. We have two rings on this side, we'll have one ring there. We have one ring this side, we'll have two rings there. So cytosine always matches to guanine, thymine always matches to adenine. They don't worry about these pyrimidines, purines, don't worry about the names for the moment. Um, that you uh, don't expect you to remember. I just want you to remember that matching C to G, C to A, so that if I give you a sequence, if I say this strand here reads A, A, T, G, let's say, okay, um, uh, then if I've got A, A, T, G, what have I got in the other strand? I must have T, T, what did I say? A, A, T, G, T, T, A, C, okay, always C to, C, to, uh, C to G, T to A, always three rings across. So that's, the, this is our first step in understanding the structure of DNA. Now, the other thing to tell you is that the, when we say that these are matched on the other side, they are actually chemically bonded together. So we've got one strand of DNA here and another strand on the other side. And those strands are ac actually stick, stuck together with chemical bonds, but they are very weak chemical bonds. So this, these bonds here, extremely strong. These bonds are very weak, but there are many, many, many of them. And it ends up the DNA is actually a very strong, very stable molecule. For our purposes in forensic science, that is tremendously important because it means the DNA is actually very durable. Even when we take it out, even when we take it out of the body, even when we take it out of the cell, if the cell bursts, DNA tends to be rather stable for quite a long time. And DNA can actually be recovered and this sequence of bases can be determined. It can be measured. It can be de scientifically determined. And there are various reasons, as I'll explain, why your DNA sequence is absolutely unique to you. You inherit your DNA. You inherit all your DNA from your parents. You inherit one set of DNA from your mother one set of DNA from your father, but what you inherit is absolutely unique. It doesn't exist outside of the egg and the sperm that meets to produce the zygote that produced you. So your DNA sequence is absolutely unique and it is unique to you. We can work out the possible combinations of sequence and they are billions upon billions upon billions the chances of two people having identical sequence who are not twins is one in 
billions and upon billions, far more than human beings have ever existed on the planet. So that is why we are able to say with a statistical certainty, when we measure, when we look at the sequence of DNA, we are able to say with statistical certainty what the likelihood is that somebody else would share those particular characteristics of the DNA. Um, let me just check. I just want to make sure that I've covered everything I want to cover. We've got the basic structure of the nucleotide. We've got how the nucleotides on the one strand are joined together, these strong bonds. We've got how the other strand is, matches this and how it is joined together. These bonds here, by the way, are called hydrogen bonds. Very weak bonds, but remember there's a gazillion of them in, in a, a single molecule of DNA. It makes the, the DNA very stable. But as is pointed out in, in the movie, this also confers on DNA one of its most important properties. And that is that the DNA can be replicated. It can be doubled up. Every time one of our cells divides, and some of our cells divide very frequently, some of our cells divide once a day. Every time a cell divides, all of its DNA has to be replicated because each cell, each resulting cell, needs to inherit all of the information. I hope you can't hear what I can hear. My neighbors have decided that they're going to demolish their, the interior of their house today and they're busy doing it as I'm speaking. Excuse me if I occasionally look a bit distracted, but it just usually means that they've just hit a sledgehammer against the wall. So where was I? When your cells divide, you've got each cell has to inherit a complete copy of the DNA because the DNA contains all of the recipes, the essential information to run the cell. Each cell needs to get that complete. Just think about this because when, if we said this, when we look at this, C always matches G, okay? T always matches to A, T to A, G to C. If I split these two strands apart, I've got a, I have a recipe here for a matching strand, right? So I split them apart and I can easily recreate the matching strands. I split, I have a double strand here, split it apart. I can recreate the matching strands very easily. As long as I have one sequence, I can easily create the other because of this matching rule. So, <laughs> To tell you a little bit about how DNA actually works inside the cell. DNA is a master recipe. Let's just say that we're going to just talk about genes for the moment. So in a gene, there's a recipe for a protein. But that protein is actually made in the cytoplasm of the cell. The DNA in our cells, human beings, DNA is all, most of our DNA is held in the nucleus. So the DNA is inside the nucleus, but the machinery to make protein is in the cytoplasm. What the cell does is goes when it requires a protein, it will go to a gene and it will read the gene and it will produce a copy of the gene in another nucleic acid. And that nu the nucleic acid that carries the copy of the recipe is called messenger RNA ribonucleic acid is very slightly different um, to DNA. Um, the first, but the most important thing to remember about it is that it is, first of all, it is single stranded. It's not double stranded like DNA. That's the one thing. The other thing is that instead of this base here called thymine, RNA has um, another base called uracil. It's very similar, but it's slightly different, and it's called uracil. And but that is a way to label the, the RNA. It tells the cell, this is RNA, and this is 
and it instructs the cell, this is what you must do with it. What is done with messenger RNA is it is read to produce a protein through the cell mechanism, cell, cellular mechanisms. DNA is stable, very long lived. RNA is not. Messenger RNA especially is relatively short lived, hours if that, um, before it's, it's broken down. DNA is very long lived, it lasts, should last your whole lifetime, okay? Um, but RNA is, is not. RNA has a, a useful lifespan and then it is degraded. Just remember the, those three differences. In DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. Just remember the name, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA. In RNA, it's a sugar called ribose. So it is ribonucleic acid. So RNA, sugar is ribose. DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose. Second, DNA is double stranded. Very long molecule, and it is double stranded. RNA is single stranded and it's usually much shorter because it's usually just a copy of a section of the DNA. So RNA, single stranded, DNA, double stranded. RNA has uracil instead of thymine. Um, and basically DNA is this very long, stable, long lived molecule. RNA, short lived and a temporary copy used to make the proteins. So with, with that in mind, realize that um, in this one strand of the DNA is a sequence which contains the information for a protein. So all of the, gene, the information of a gene is contained in what we refer to as the base sequence. The base sequence, if we're looking at this here, is T, G, T, G, C, T, Okay, and the matching strand of DNA must be A, G, C, A, C, A, because T always matches to A, G always matches to C. Okay, so when we read up here, what we're looking at here is the base sequence. And in any gene, it's just one strand that has, that, um, has the, the, the recipe sequence if you want to think of it that way. Now, we need to just give you a little bit of understanding about why our, uh, our gene, each of us has some total of genetic information which we refer to as the genome. That's all your DNA sequence. Each of us, our DNA, our genome is unique. It is absolutely unique. And unless you have um, an identical twin, if you have an identical twin, then you share genetic information, you share the same genetic information. The reason for that is need, we need to understand how in fact we produce egg and sperm. Now egg and sperm are very specialized cells. Most of our cells in our bodies contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we have 23, that's 46 chromosomes in total in our cells. When we produce, just think of when we reproduce, if our egg, if the egg from the female and the sperm from the male each contain 46 chromosomes, and they got together, what would we end up with? We'd end up with a cell with 92 chromosomes. Okay, fine. Now we got somebody wandering around with 92 chromosomes. They produce eggs with 92 chromosomes and somebody else produces sperm with 92 chromosomes. They get together and it's what, 184 chromosomes. That's not workable, right? We can't have eggs and sperm preserving this 46 chromosome number. Instead, what happens is in egg and in sperm, they undergo a type of cell, a specialized type of cell division called meiosis. 
where they halve the number of chromosomes. So they are, first of all, egg contains only 23 chromosomes, sperm only contains 23 chromosomes. Fertilized egg with sperm and what you end up with, you're back to 46. When that eventually that grows up to be a fetus then and adults and everything and reproduces, produces eggs or sperm, produces gametes in other words, that's the proper word for them. The gametes, when they are produced, have we have to halve the amount of genetic information. So that's the first thing. The second thing to understand is that in the process of halving the information, we don't simply keep all the male, all the contribution of the father and throw away the mother or keep all the contribution of the mother and throw away everything from the father. When you look at your inside your cells, each of your chromosomes is paired, right? You've got one chromosome from your mother that is matched with one chromosome from your father. Okay? That's where we get 23 pairs from. 23 chromosomes come from your mother. 23 chromosomes come from your father. When we produce gametes, eggs or sperm, we've got to halve the amount, but we don't simply throw away all of one or of the other. Instead, a very special process takes place in which the chromosomes swap information. They jumble up and they form entirely new combinations of information then they, they, they separate and they form cells, specialized cells, egg or sperm, which have 23 unique chromosomes. Those unique chromosomes are composed of genetic information from both mother and father that has been mixed up into a unique combination. Each egg and each sperm is unique, has a unique genetic identity. Now we take an egg and we fertilize it with sperm from another entirely different person. And what we're doing is we're taking unique ge genetic information and we're fertilizing an egg with unique genetic information and we're creating a fertilized egg, a zygote with an entirely unique identity. And we can measure that identity. We can, I, we can go to the DNA of, that, of those cells and we can sequence the DNA. So that is the, the first thing to understand. I know it's a little bit difficult to, to follow, but um, just to use this paragraph here um, in your uh, revision of this material and you will be able to, re to remember and to understand that during the process of forming egg and of forming sperm, the DNA is recombined. It is recombined into unique genetic sequences that then get together to form a unique zygote. Okay, so accepting that each, each uh, genetic identity is in fact unique, how do we determine that? Do we have to go now and sequence all of the meters and meters of DNA that are present in a human cell? No, we don't. We don't. Because there are special circumstances in the DNA. We're not even going to worry about the sequence of the genes. Instead, in forensic science, we're going to go and look at the intervening bits of DNA because the intervening bits of DNA have their own characteristics. And we can sequence those in ways that we'll discuss later. We'll seek, be able to sequence those and distinguish one person's DNA from another person's DNA. We don't have to sequence the entire amount of DNA that's present in the cells. Okay, so this is the molecule itself. This is very beautiful, I think, um, molecule and this remember this about DNA. Uh, DNA is unique in that it is a mo the, mo the molecule, which is the basis of all life on earth. 
all living things, by definition, have DNA as their genetic material. The only exception are the viruses. Some of the viruses use RNA, but viruses are not living things. Okay? They are not alive. They are very complicated biochemicals, but they're not alive. Every living thing uses this molecule, DNA, as its master recipe. So remember what we discussed before. Here on the outside here, spiraling round, there are the, the sugar phosphate um, bonds that's forming this backbone around the outside. Here's the matching molecule there with its sugar phosphate bonds. And across the middle here, like here shown like rungs of a ladder, um, would be the matching bases, A to T, C to G, G to C, T to A, in whatever sequence is necessary to spell out the particular information that is contained in that piece of DNA. Um, the reason that this um, helix arises is simply that when we take one nucleotide, and we bond it to the next one, it bonds at a slight angle. So each one, there's a slight angle. And so the angles accumulate um, in three-dimensional space to form this beautiful double helix. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the biology of DNA. Um, just so that you can understand, because we're going to talk in forensic science about two specific uh, sources of DNA. The vast majority, the bulk of our DNA lies inside a specialized part of the cell, an organelle called the cell nucleus. Here it is here. It has a, a double membrane around it. Here's the outside of the cell. The cell membrane is the outside of the cell and defines a cell. But inside each living cell, there is a, a nucleus, except for some special instances. Can you remember which? We've talked about cells that didn't have a nucleus. What were they? Correct. The red blood corpuscles, for example, had no. So and in specialized circumstances, then there may not be a nucleus, but the vast majority of our cells contain a nucleus and the nucleus is packed with our 46 chromosomes, the 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, or this would be all of their DNA inside the nucleus. So that is called the nuclear DNA. Um, but there's another source of DNA, which in forensic science can sometimes be extremely important. Inside our cells, we have specialized little organelles which produce the energy of the cell. And these are the mitochondria. And mitochondria are very interesting for all sorts of reasons. But the one thing that we need to remember is that mitochondria have their own DNA. It's not very much. It's a small, it, their chromosome, it's a single chromosome and it's a circle. And, um, but every, we have many mitochondria and uh, each of the mitochondria has its own little genome associated. So first of all, I've described to you where our nucleus comes from. Our nucleus arises, half of the chromosomes in the nucleus come from the mother half of the chromosomes come from the father. So half of the, but they're in unique combinations that have arisen during meiosis. So that's all, our 23 pairs of chromosomes are contained here in the nucleus. There, so the nuclear DNA is inherited from your father and from your mother, half, half. That's easy to understand, but the mitochondrion is inherited only from your mother. When an egg is fertilized by a sperm, all that the sperm donates uh, of significance is its nucleus. It injects its nucleus into the egg 
to fertilize and to double up the number of, of chromosomes. The egg has 23 chromosomes, the sperm has 23 chromosomes, put them together, 46 chromosomes, but the sperm is unable to inject a mitochondrion. So all of our mitochondria are already present in the egg. So we inherit our mitochondria from our mothers. And our mothers inherited their mitochondria from their mothers and so on and so on and so on. You can trace the history of your mitochondria by tracing them your maternal line of inheritance. So this is, has an important implication because the DNA contained in the nucleus is unique. It is individual character, right? And if we can sequence, even if we just sequencing portions of it, we we'll look, we'll be able to establish individual character. We might be able to tie the sequence to a particular person with certain statistical certainty. But you share your mitochondria with a big group of people. And they are all the people who are in that maternal line. Start tracing it back. Start tracing that maternal line back through your siblings, then through your cousins, through your second cousins, third cousins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're pretty soon looking at a large group of people who share mitochondrial DNA sequence. Mitochondrial DNA sequence does not give us individual character. It gives us class character, but it may still be very important. Sometimes the D DNA, uh, uh, nuclear DNA, degrades. Um, it, will, it, it will eventually degrade, especially if it's in the open air. So from a body fluid, blood, semen, or something like that, eventually the nuclear DNA may well degrade and be lost. But the mitochondrial DNA is very tough. The mitochondrion itself gives it some sort of protection. Even if the mitochondrion dies and dries up, the DNA inside the mitochondrion is long, tends to be quite tough and tends to outlast the nuclear DNA. And we may, the only genetic information we may be able to get eventually is from mitochondrial DNA. Doesn't give us individual character, but it may be useful class character. It may be able to allow us to assign a particular sample to a group of people. We know this sample came from this group of people. And I'll describe later on some very interesting cases where this has been, where this has happened. Okay, so at this point, what I want you to watch another little movie. And um, this is a movie um, which describes the very first instance where a crime was solved by DNA sequencing by looking at the at particular characteristics of DNA. This is how the entire science, forensic science of DNA sequencing arose. And um, so that is this movie here. So please watch it now. And then next time we will carry on with our discussion and I'll describe in more detail how it is that certain parts of the DNA um, end up being unique to particular people. Okay. So, um, and I'll see you again on Wednesday.